Hi, I'm Katherine Mello, Alumni Director at UNMC. On behalf of my colleague Lee Dinker with the UNO Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you to the fourth session of our Alumni Virtual Lunch and Learn Town Hall. Sorry about that. On behalf of my colleague Lee Dinker with the UNO. Sorry about that. Just a little bit of a technical problem here. Since we've started these, this series, we have cr created a bunch of content that we hope has been informative and interesting through a collaboration between our two alumni associations. As a reminder, all the past sessions are available for streaming on our alumni association's YouTube page, as will be today's session when we're finished. Today's session is one that I know I I'm very interested in hearing more about with weeks and weeks and weeks of social distancing now under our belts. Joining me today is Dr. Ali Khan, Dean of the UNMC College of Public Health. Dr. Khan is here to talk with us about what is a coronavirus peak? What does that mean? What should we expect and when can we expect it? Also, this session is designed to be interactive. So Dr. Khan will present for the first half of the session and then take questions for the second part. Please be sure to leave your questions in the comments of the live stream. And please let us know where you're from so we know who's joining us today. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Khan. Thank you, Catherine. That was a lovely introduction. So I was asked to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and so I'm going to talk about a jailbreak. Um, and as you know, COVID-19 is due to a coronavirus, and corona sounds for crown. So I talk about the viral king keeping us locked up at home, and the tiger king is what we're watching as we're locked up from home. So this is going to be about a jailbreak. And I have a couple of slides to show you. Um, and uh, so there's five ways to make this jailbreak, and it looks like it looks like there's going to be a little time delay on these slides, so we're going to see how this works. So the five ways to make this jailbreak are the first way, oh, okay, before we get to the jailbreak, these were the five things, these were the five things that Catherine asked me to talk to you about. When, are we, when is the peak going to be? When will, when will we know it's the peak? What does normalcy look like? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to ignore that. So let's just go to my set of slides of what I really want to talk about. <laughs> so we're going to, so the, uh, you'll see a slide pop up now about the jailbreak uh, and how we're going to make this jailbreak. So the first, the first slide about make, the first way to, what, you lost a slide here. Keep going. Jailbreak slide, lockdown slide. Nope. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wing this completely now, folks. Okay. So, the first way you can make a jailbreak is if you eradicate the disease, and we did that originally with SARS. So, this coronavirus is very similar to the coronavirus we had in 2003 called SARS. That was severe acute respiratory syndrome. That disease, fortunately was not as widespread as this one, and we got rid of it in about six months. And there's some countries trying to use the same approach for this coronavirus, um, SARS coronavirus 2 that's causing COVID-19. So New Zealand, England, Vietnam, uh, Australia, they're trying to use the same type of approach to get rid of this disease. Uh, so that's one strategy. The second strategy to make a jailbreak is if you have a vaccine. So if we can vaccinate everybody, then of course we can all get out and about and do our things. Now unfortunately, a vaccine is at least 12 to 18 months away. And that's optimistic because I have been waiting 12 to 18 months for an HIV vaccine, uh, and I still haven't seen the HIV vaccine after 30 years of waiting. So I just want to caution people who are waiting for the, you know, this new coronavirus vaccine that it may not be 12 to 18 months away. 
The third way that you can make a jailbreak is with a drug, and you make the jailbreak with the drug because then we wouldn't be as concerned about people getting sick because then you can treat them, they wouldn't have these severe illness that would require them to go on a ventilator, be in the ICU, or God forbid die. So that's a third way you could make a jailbreak. The fourth way you can make a jailbreak, which is a very, very bad way to make a jailbreak, is what people refer to as herd immunity. And the herd immunity jailbreak is when, oh, you know what, let's just all go out and let's just all get infected. So herd immunity jailbreak would be infecting essentially 60 to 70 percent of Americans. Now, why that's a really bad idea is we probably so far have infected, my guess would be at most 5 to 10 percent of Americans. And you saw what happened in New York City when we infected 5 to 10 percent of Americans, right? So we have had over 50,000 deaths. People couldn't get into the emergency room. We were a few days away from ventilators. We infected 4,000 healthcare workers, right? We do not want to infect 50 to 70 percent of Americans, right? That would be a disaster. So that's the fourth way to make a jailbreak. The fifth way to make a jailbreak, which is what we're all trying to do now, is I call that the containment strategy, right? And the containment strategy is how can we slowly roll back our social distancing guidelines and find a new, better normal where we're decreasing cases in our community and slowly getting back to doing things in our community. So that would be the containment strategy. And if we have some slides, maybe I can show you a few of those. So what do we have, have up there? Do we have a couple of slides I can show folks? You're, so you're showing people right now a, uh, so what you're seeing on this slide is a little science slide. And the reason I'm showing this slide to you is to make the point that the reason this disease is so difficult to treat is that people get in, are infectious before they have symptoms. And that is why this has been difficult to get under control and why it has not been like SARS in 2003. And this is why, as part of our containment strategy, we need to do that contact tracing. We need to find these individuals who are contacts very quickly and get them in quarantine, because even if they're really good citizens and they know if they get sick, they need to stay home, they could be infectious two days before they get sick and still be out and about. So that's why I showed that slide, why contact tracing is so important. Okay, this isn't going to work. All right, there's, uh, there's going to be, I will share these slides on, uh, on, on Facebook Live to you. So let me just talk through what I was going to, what I was going to say. So in the United States, um, we have peaked in cases, and hopefully we will start declining those cases. However, the outbreak in the U.S. is really over a hundred different outbreaks. So each state has its own outbreak, and even within the state, and Nebraska is a good example, each county and city is having its own different outbreak. So what's going on in Douglas County is very different from what's going on in Adams County or Hastings County, et cetera. And what we'll likely see is that we will be able to loosen restrictions in a different way. So here in Nebraska, we're having a big problem with meatpacking plants, for example. So those counties, maybe you will have to release restrictions, uh, wait for restrictions longer in those counties than other counties that are seeing few or no cases or declining cases. So trying to help you understand that this will not be an all or none process. This will depend on what's going on within specific areas to make those decisions. Now, once you make those decisions based on what's going on locally, let's talk about what it looks like. And what it's going to look like is actually the opposite of how we put these restrictions on board. So initially, when people are out and about, we should expect that there will continue to be social distancing. So expect to see people wearing masks. 
expect to see people checking temperatures, lots of hand washing, lots of social distancing. Uh, probably in restaurants and other businesses will be told that you can only have one-fourth to one-fifth of the people that you usually have. Uh, we're hopeful that when s schools reopen that um, they may even use strategies such as, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday strategies to decrease density of students. Uh, within classrooms. So there's people will be thinking of all sorts of ways to try to decrease lots of individuals congregated together so that they're not getting uh, infected. So that's part of that new normal. I talk about a better normal because I'm a public health person and I would like to see a better normal that includes things like universal health care for people, paid paid leave, uh, uh, family leave for people, child care uh, expenses paid. So I'd like, you know, addressing some of those social inequities that sort of showed up during this outbreak. You know, uh, this is a, this, it's the same storm for everybody, but we're not all in, all in the same lifeboat, uh, unfortunately. So it'll be a new normal. I hope it'll be a better normal for us, but please expect that things will be a lot more different. Uh, now, the big concern I hear a lot is that if we're not doing a lot of testing and finding cases and doing quarantine, there is a concern that we will have low-level transmission that will lead to a second wave. And that is a legitimate concern. All the data we have, for example, if you look at what happened in New York City, if you look at what happened in Seattle, if you look at what happened in California, there was likely two to four, even six weeks of tr low level transmission going on in the community before enough cases happened that it started to spike. And that's when people recognized that they had a problem. But it wasn't like the first two or three cases that people recognized they have a problem. So that would be the concern again, that if we're not being very diligent from a public health standpoint, and we're fortunate we have an amazing local and state public health department here in Nebraska, that if we're not being diligent, there are going to be these cases in the community and then all of a sudden we'll see a second spike, which may make it necessary to start social distancing again. So we need to be very careful. Good public health is going to keep that second spike uh, from happening and allow us to escape the viral king and not have to keep watching the tiger king. Okay, we have some questions for you now. Okay. So, you kind of already mentioned it, but I wanted to start with this because I thought it was kind of fun. Okay. So, you, you titled your session today, The Reign of the Crowned Viral King. Just elaborate on that a sure. little bit more. Great, too. So, uh, the coronavirus, so, the coronavirus sounds for crowned virus, and it's a crown virus because there's a spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus uh, that gives it the semblance of a crown. And so that's why I call it a crown virus or crown viral king. And so that's why I titled it the crown viral king. It was clever. Uh, so you talked about social distancing, relaxing some social distancing. What would you say about vulnerable populations? How might things look different for some populations versus others? Now that's, that's an excellent question uh, by the listener. So it's going to look, unfortunately, very different for vulnerable populations. So they would be the last group that would uh, be sort of asked or uh, permitted to sort of or suggested to come back out of their stay-at-home orders uh, because they will remain most at risk. And so you would want to see the lowest level of community transmission before people who are vulnerable are out and back uh, amongst the community. And even then, they would be the last group who you would then say be out amongst larger groups, you know, groups of 10, 20, et cetera. So they, they would always be amongst the last, out and last amongst larger groups. And even normal, healthy people, I would say it will be a long time, for example, before we go to big sporting events. Because we, we now know even during this time when everything's shut down, any setting where we have lots of people, we have cases, meatpacking plants, prisons, long-term care facilities, uh, aircraft carriers. Even now, anytime you put a whole bunch of people together, you get outbreaks. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about a peak, the peak itself. We mm -hmm. have a question from a listener about the peak. So first of all, maybe just start out and maybe define the peak. What does sure. that mean? And then 
This is a very um, more specific question about the parameters that are utilized to predict the timing of a peak, um, how they're different, maybe in Nebraska versus South Dakota or somewhere else. Okay, so that's, that's an excellent question. So the peak essentially is when you have the most cases and there's different peaks. So the peak for cases will be different than the peak for deaths because deaths follow cases. Uh, and you predict that using what are called, um, uh, there are different modeling techniques that predict this, and they're usually called the susceptible infection and recovered model, the SI, SIR model, the SIER model. So there's all sorts of models that sort of help you predict that. So that's how we sort of predict when the peak is going to to be. Uh, and again, I tell people all models are wrong, some are useful, uh, but uh, the point being that there's no one model for the U.S. Every, there's not one outbreak in the U.S. There's multiple outbreaks going on in the U.S. And it may not necessarily be a peak. So this has been unusual that we have seen for a disease where everybody's susceptible, where we have sort of seen it peak and come down. because. For we, it just could sort of peak again, sort of be more like a mountain range than just a peak and come down. So there's a lot about this virus that we don't know, and I don't want people to get the sense that, okay, we've peaked, it's going to come down, and we're done. I think people should recognize that there's probably, you know, 80% of Americans that are still, you know, susceptible, <laughs> and we could still get a whole lot more cases. And so then just dis- dis- describe what a wave is. Okay. You were kind of starting to right. go into that, I think, but what is that? What's the definition? So, so what a wave would be would be essentially additional set of cases leading, uh, leading to a large increase and then going down again. So we saw this large wave of cases that was mainly driven by what happened on the East Coast. But lots of areas of the U.S. were spared. So, for example, Texas, with their large cities, could have had hundreds of thousands of cases, and we didn't see that happen, fortunately. But that could still happen. Chicago, all sorts of large metropolitan areas in the United States. You know, there's lots of susceptibles left where we could see a repeat of New York City happen. And that's what another wave would look like. And we're seeing it here in Nebraska, right? So we're now seeing a wave happen uh, in uh, rural parts of Nebraska that have meat packing plants. For the last five days, we've had over 300 cases every day in, in Nebraska in these rural counties with meat packing plants. Mm-hmm. So switching subjects a little bit, uh, mixed messages about masks. Who should wear one? Where should we wear one? Uh, talk a little bit about what would be your best recommendations for using a mask. So my best recommendation is everybody except for kids under two, except for young kids, everybody should be wearing masks all the time when you're outside. That's my recommendation for masks. And you're wearing masks primarily because of that curve I showed you. People who are infection, people who are infected can be spreading virus before they know they're sick. So I'm, I'm going to assume everybody's a good citizen, and if they're sick, they're staying home, so they're not infecting anybody. But even if you're a good citizen, for 48 hours before you know you're sick, you could be infecting people. So the mask helps you not put virus out to other people. Also, uh, the other part is the mask also protects you from people spitting in your face, coughing, and sneezing in your face and nose. What about uh, women, women who are pregnant? Anything special you'd want to talk to women who are expecting? So uh, fortunately, um, and back to the, ma- remember it's not just masks, it's also hand washing and all the other things. So I don't want people to think the masks is the panacea, right? You have to do everything else with the masks. So fortunately, it looks like pregnant women are not at much higher risk than, other, than others, uh, which is good news. However, the same set of recommendations to them about, about masks and hand washing uh, also apply. Let's go back to talking about the vaccine and then the drug. Maybe okay. talk again about the difference between the two. Uh, what's some good news maybe you've heard from somewhere, anywhere, on the potential for a drug or a vaccine? Okay. Sure. So uh, the, the good news for vaccines are there are three vaccines currently in people's arms. So there's a, there's a vaccine, uh, there's four, I think, one in China, one in England, 
and two in the U.S. So I believe there's four vaccines currently that have made their way into people's arms. So these are called phase one studies. They're generally safety studies. So that's fabulous news that, so, that you know, this disease is four or five months old, right? And we've already got vaccine into people's arms. That's amazing news. And some of them already have uh, some animal data that suggests that they, may be, that they may be good choices. So that's fabulous news. But again, uh, having a vaccine that you start a phase one study on does not mean you will eventually get to phase three studies and that we will be able, that it will be, you know, that it will work in the end. But the good news is that the, and there are already vaccines in people's arms, and I believe there's already, there's 60 vaccine candidates out there. Okay, so that's the good news. If you wanted the good news, okay, good news. For drugs, the good news is that there are over a dozen drugs in clinical trials right now, including right here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We have a number of drugs in randomized trials, and those are the good trials. Those are the good studies where you try a drug with a placebo so nobody knows what they're getting, and then at the end of that you see if the drug works or not. So the, U so the University of Nebraska Medical Center is actively engaged in those studies. Uh, and hopefully some of those studies will show that some of the drugs that we're testing may actually work. Uh, so there's uh, good news on that front. There's nothing at this point that we know does work, uh, but hopefully of the numerous drugs that are being tested, something would be helpful. Kim, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit on you. Okay. Talk about rural areas. Okay. Uh, there's some disparities in rural areas about healthcare workers and what differently may be done there, if anything, to help out in those communities? So, excellent question, especially given here Nebraska and a focus for the college and the university on, on uh, rural Nebraska. So, r rural Nebraska has its own set of challenges with their critical hospitals, um, which are s actually all hospitals in America are suffering right now as we've stopped elective procedures and people are not going to the hospital. But do they have enough beds? Do they have enough health care workers to provide care to the patients? A number of the hospitals in rural Nebraska, now that they're seeing patients, have to send them out of their community. And so they need to make sure they have the uh, emergency medical services are trained and ready to do that and that they're able to take care of the patients who do show up. So those are the challenges in, in rural Nebraska. Then they have the challenges, obviously, as we've been seeing with the meatpacking plants. They have the challenges with the long-term care facilities uh, there. And then they have the challenges of having enough resources, not just in the health care space, but in the public health space and local public health space. So rural Nebraska has its own set of challenges, just as urban Nebraska has its own set of challenges, as we've seen here in Omaha. For example, we have a disproportionate number of people uh, who are black who, who have been infected with uh, COVID-19. So uh, different parts of the state have their own challenges and why I like to talk about not a new normal, but I like to talk about a better normal uh, after this outbreak. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about, obviously it's in the news that there are some states that are starting to release some restrictions and starting to open back up, so to speak. Um, Talk a little bit about the frontline workers. What what should they maybe do to help protect themselves? And um, just as what are some guidelines as we start to release some of this, re, some, relax some of the social distancing? Sure. So, do you have a, which frontline workers, Catherine? Thinking you of think like of maybe a, perhaps restaurants, restaurant well, okay, workers. Okay. Okay. Uh, so people in restaurants sure. and stuff like that. Uh, so. There's two pieces, in my mind, there's always two pieces to this. One piece is, how are you protecting the employees? So that's, so if you're a restaurant worker, you want to make sure that everybody who works in the restaurant, so that's talking about employees, is healthy, right? So are there good management practices that if somebody is sick, doesn't show up at work? because then they're putting you at risk, right? So there's those practices within the restaurant, and we usually layer them as people who are sick don't show up. What are practices around um, within the building around air exchange? There's all sorts of things around the building, no knobs, you know, no handles, things you can do in the building, and then administrative practices 
to make it safe for you to come, sick leave, etc. All the things we need to do so that sick people don't show up and you're safe. Make sure there's protective equipment for you, a mask and other things, hand washing stations, etc. So that's one piece. But then there's a second piece, which is the customers who come in, what is the restaurant or the facility making doing to make sure that the customers who come in aren't also infecting you, right? And so then what are those practices being put in place to say, well, are you screening customers who are coming in to make sure they don't have a temperature? Are you saying, you know, sir, ma'am, we'd like to make sure you wear a mask if you come into our establishment? Uh, or, you know, so all the, or, and then how are you sort of putting spaces so there's social distancing between individuals? How are you handing out stuff so there's least amount of interaction between you and the customer? Are you doing contact pay options so there's no receipts and, and uh, pens being shared between people? So I think this is, these are the conversations you have to how are you protecting yourself from other employees and how are you protecting yourself from customers? So it's a long list of things to go down and have those conversations. A lot to think about. A lot, a lot to, to think, think about. about, right? Anytime you interact or touch something between somebody, you need to think about, do I really need to touch this thing? Okay. Let's talk about the future a little bit. What lessons maybe have you gleaned from this experience that would help us in the future? How can we prevent, is it even possible to prevent something like this from happening again? Or how can we apply what we've learned now to just make us safer down the road? So it was absolutely possible to prevent <laughs> where we are now. Uh, and we're already doing that. So I don't, so but let's not talk about the future, or let's talk about the near future, which is how do we get out of the mess we're in now? And it's all about public health, right? Which, you know, so we talked about it. How do we get the testing up? How do we, and find the cases, do the contact tracing. This is all the work of public health we need to do, right? How do we make sure we have the surge capacity in the hospitals, how are we going out to the businesses to help make sure they're prepared, make sure the schools are prepared, make sure the long-term care facilities are prepared. This is the business of public health, and we need to have stronger public health, and we're going to do that now, and I hope we maintain that so we prevent the next pandemic. Okay, I have two questions as long as we have enough time. So the second to last one would be, we have a question from one of our alums who's a dentist who oh. wants you to talk a little bit about dental practice. There's been a couple other questions as part of this question and others about aerosol spray and some of the findings that have come out about how this lingers in the air. So talk a little bit about what maybe you'd recommend for dentists or how should they get access to that information? So that is an excellent question and we're looking forward to having a conversation with the Dean of the Dental College, Dr. Guthmiller, Dr. Janet Guthmiller, who's amazing, uh, uh, to think about what practices should look like here in the community. Uh, and I would also reach out, obviously, to the American Dental Association. But aerosols are, are very problematic um, in, um, in practices. And as you decrease the community transmission, so as there are fewer and fewer cases within the community, obviously, you're more and more protected and the question is where's that threshold when there are sufficiently few cases in the community that you can feel comfortable in creating aerosols within your practice but going back to the restaurant question what can you do within your practice to protect yourself the people who are, and who are within your practice that may you may not have thought about previously and we're doing this in the healthcare setting you know thinking about how do we intubate people without creating aerosols now so it may require some new engineering controls, new practices uh, to try to make sure that you protect yourself as much as possible from aerosols. Okay, then last question. Uh, as the Dean of the College of Public Health, I wanted to give you the chance to talk about one or two things high level that the College of Public Health has had a hand in at UNMC and what are some of the accomplishments that have come because it's been, it's been very exciting to see some of the developments coming out of the college. Why don't you oh, talk about that? Oh, that's very, that's, that's very kind of you. So uh, the College of Public Health has had a long focus on health security, which is a lot of what we're doing now with the 
COVID-19 uh, outbreak, but it's also had a lot, a lot of focus in rural health, which has intersected with the COVID-19 activities, a lot of focus with implementation science, and that's how do we take our science and make it work within the community, which also is coming into play with the COVID-19, and then the fourth area of focus has been um, cancer prevention and control. Uh, so it's been nice to see that the work we have been doing for the last decade or so to become the premier college of public health has played out well. We have an amazing community that we work in, amazing partners uh, that we work for. And it's nice that when I say public health now, everybody knows what I'm talking about. I don't have to explain public health. And I'm looking forward to the continued support of our listeners right now and our community uh, for the for the Public College of Public Health and public health here in the state of Nebraska. Thank you so much for being with us today. And sorry about the technical difficulties we experienced at the beginning. We'll get the information online for everyone to be able to see. And we'll get to those questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Just a couple closing reminders for you. Our series will continue next week, May 5th at 1230 on Facebook Live. The topic for next week is avoid avoiding COVID-19 scams. So we're talking about cybersecurity next week. Many of our alumni have asked how they can show their support right now. On your screen, you'll see a link to the Maverick Food Pantry, which serves students both at UNO and UNMC. There's a link there if you'd like to make a contribution. And finally, just on a more personal level, we want to know how you, our alumni, are doing. There's email addresses on the screen for our two alumni associations. Drop us a note and let us know how it's going for you. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week.